If you've got a car in the DC metro area like I do, you know that sometimes it can be a real bummer, which is why there's Car Care to Go, the future of car maintenance and repair. I recently had to get repairs on my car and they picked up my car from my apartment and they brought it back when the work was done. They also texted me to let me know what services were being completed on my car, so I got full control. The valet was free and you can get your free synthetic oil change for $20.23. Like what you heard? Book now at carcaretogo.com. Here's what DC is talking about. It's official. DC's flag is awesome. And Maryland's isn't too shabby either. Virginia's, well, today we are talking with two leading vexillologists. That is flag experts to you. These guys are going to walk us through how the DC flag became so ubiquitous and why it works. Today is Wednesday, March 22nd. I'm Michael Schaefer, and this is CityCast DC. Ted Kay and Jack Lowe, you are both vexillologists, which means you are flag experts. I'm so excited to have you here to talk about flags of the DMV. Thanks for having us, Michael. So, Jack, tell me, the DC flag is kind of everywhere. The DC flag is everywhere. It's one of the few city flags that has been tremendously popular with the population. And part of that is because it has such a wonderful design. And so you see the D.C. flag on all sorts of establishments with modifications of the bars and the stars, and it has become one of the most popular tattoos in the area (laughs) as well. So we know that this flag has taken on. So what is the what's the history of this flag? What's its story? How did did it get here? It's it's very simple that uh, around the time of World War One, when most of the, pretty much all the states had adopted state flags by then, the people in the District of Columbia decided they should have a flag too. And the commissioners uh, who ran the district appointed uh, a committee who decided to use uh, George Washington's family coat of arms. And that was the, the two stripes and three stars was? The two red stripes uh, surmounted by three red stars. And it was a, a very simple choice. And... Uh, it caught on. Now, there was, of course, a, always a lot of disagreement with everything in the District of Columbia because there was no popular input because we don't have significant home rule in this city. But anyway, that's where it came back. It was officially adopted in 1938. You know, maybe the lack of popular input's a good thing. Too many cooks. Uh, well, Ted can speak to that. <laughs> so, Ted, why, why is it ranked so highly? The five basic principles of flag design are simplicity, meaningful symbolism, two to three colors, no lettering or seals, and distinctiveness. And Washington, D.C.'s flag hits all of those. And when we poll our members and the public, asking them to rate the design qualities of flags, Washington, D.C.'s flag floats to the top. Because it serves two roles, as a city flag and as a state-slash-territory flag, It has been in both of our major surveys that we did in the early 2000s. And in the survey of state flags, it was, I think, uh, third from the highest or sixth from the highest of all state flags. I mean, lots of competition among the great state flags. Less competition among great city flags. Washington actually edged Chicago by a very small amount. So Washington got the highest rating of any city flag in our survey. Jack, you you said you mentioned this, and I wonder maybe the simplicity is the reason why there are so many creative adaptations of the flags. But what, like, what are some of your favorites of that? There's a lot of uh, ones where the stars are replaced by baseballs, or the stars are replaced by bicycles, or the stars are replaced by marijuana leaves. Uh, every political campaign sign has some reference to the bars and the stars in it. Everyone who runs for the city council uses that. So it's easy to adapt. In fact, there is a whole website called DC Adapters that a friend of mine has been doing for a number of years. uh, And he's got hundreds of adaptations of the DC flag. Indeed, I would say I would say that the DC flag meets the criteria of creating a remixable design language to represent the district. 
That's language that comes from Roman Mars, the TED Talk host and podcast host about design, that having a design that can be remixed into various uses shows how powerful that DC design is. So you're saying like if it was if this was one of these complicated flags that had like a city crest in it and some words and so it would be much harder to remix it with baseballs or beer signs. Correct. So I got to ask you both why should we care about flags? I mean they're interesting, but I think you both believe there's actually something deeper here. I've come to realize that flags are the ultimate icon of our tribalism. And those tribes might be geographic, neighborhood, city, state, country, they might be religious, they might be sports, they might be military, they might be schools, alumni, etc. But all of those is tied into our tribalism. Jack? I think that's, that's a very good summary. It's identification. People use flags as identification. Now, you can also use a lapel pin, but uh, flags are a good deal more dramatic. And flags have the dynamic of floating in the wind. And so it, it's an active symbol. It doesn't, doesn't just sit. I mean, you can, of course, put it on a piece of paper or on a wall, but a flag is meant to be flying in the wind and to be shimmering and to be uh, impressive. And that's why good flag designs uh, are those in which, when you see it floating from the flagpole, you can identify it readily. So the basic function of a flag is signaling at a distance. A flag needs to be recognizable. You need to be able to make out what's on it. And it needs to be memorable. Hence, simplicity is the hallmark of great flag design. Yeah. You know, and those flags that are poorly designed people basically ignore them and they mix them up. There's a great story that's happened a number of years ago where one of our uh, Vexillology Association members was visiting a Pennsylvania state government office and he said to the woman, do you know you've got the New York state flag flying <laughs> outside your office? And, they, and she said, isn't that Pennsylvania? Because it was just one of the many navy blue flags with the seal in the middle. So I suspect in D.C.'s case, because of the city's weird political status, a place that's been kicked around and marginalized, waving that flag is also a tribal sign of like, hey, listen, I'm, you know, I'm standing up for myself. This was it was like incorporated into like punk bands in the 1980s. The Nation of Ulysses used to mount a D.C. flag behind them on the stage. Mm -hmm. And that's you know, that's not a problem we have on the other side of Western Avenue in Maryland. But that's another place where people are really into the flag. Absolutely. And that's a, very, a much more recent phenomenon. Why does that flag resonate so much? Well, that flag, which a lot of people feel is abysmal because it's so complicated to them. They say it's just a hot <laughs> mess. But uh, it resonates, I think, because it is so distinct. It is based on a coat of arms. It's a, 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 a heraldry, a heraldic flag. And that's unusual for United States flags. But this is a recent phenomenon, the great popularity of the flag. And really, this has to goes back to maybe 10, 15 years ago with Kevin Plank, who is the founder of the Under Armour Company. He was a graduate of the University of Maryland. He was a Marylander. And at the time that he started his company in his grandmother's basement, he was looking for ways to promote his company and one of the ways he decided to promote his company was to donate or to make, maybe to sell at low price, the uniforms for the University of Maryland football team. And so all of a sudden, the black and gold became very obvious with people who watched football. Then it went on to the basketball teams. And now, since the University of Maryland has switched from the Atlantic Coast Conference to the Big Ten, it gets a tremendous viewership that it never did before. And so the popularity of the flag, you see it in people wearing socks and shirts and whatnot, has really just been in the last 10, 15 years. Uh, so if the DC flag is the Washington family crest, yes. what's the history of the, like, whose who's heraldic symbol is that? And is there a controversy it is, there? It is the flag, the heraldic flag of the Calvert and Crossland families. And it was in use all throughout the colonial period. Just the black and gold, usually not with the red and white, although sometimes you would see, apparently you would see that. And then it sort of fell out of favor after independence. And 
After that, Maryland flags were mostly used by the military, the militia, the National Guard, and it was a navy blue flag with a seal in the middle. At the time of the Civil War, the Maryland Confederate troops, because Maryland was a very divided state and almost seceded, they used the cross as a, as a lapel pin, and oftentimes it used the red and white cross to show that they were from Maryland. After the war, in the spirit of reconciliation, people put it back together again. And apparently you started in the late 19th century seeing that flag with, with the four quadrants, as opposed to just one flag with the black and gold. And then it was adopted uh, officially in... 1904. 1904, thank you. And and Maryland actually is one of the few states with an official finial for the top of its flagpole. Wait, wait, the finial is the device finial? is the device on the top of top the flag. Of the flag. Sometimes you see an eagle or a ball or something like that. Or a In spear. Maryland, the official finial is that cross from the Crossland quadrant with, with the buttons of the Maryland on, with coat the of arms. buttons on the end. And that's fascinating to me because nobody knows how the cross got from being a cross with fleur-de-lis on the ends to a cross with the round balls on the end. But that's it. Maryland not only has an official flag, it has an official, official flag pole topper. Since 1945. Framebridge, the custom framing company, is the perfect way to refresh your space for the new year by framing everything, everything that matters to you. That's because they can frame bridge just about anything. Game day jerseys, selfies, your anniversary dinner menu, artwork, your favorite movie poster, a love letter from the people at CityCast DC, anything. Here's how it works. You go to framebridge.com and upload a digital photo. If you have a physical piece to frame, like a poster, they will send you complimentary packaging to safely mail it into their owned and operated studio where the framing will begin. You preview the piece online in dozens of frame styles. You choose your favorites. The experts at FrameBridge will custom frame your piece and deliver your finished piece directly to your door, ready to hang. And instead of paying hundreds, their prices start at 39 bucks. You can order online at FrameBridge.com or you can shop at a FrameBridge store near you, which if you live in D.C. means a whole bunch of stores. Get started today. Frame your photos or give someone the perfect gift. Go to FrameBridge.com and place your order now. All right. So, you know, in this region where the D.C. flag, awesome, Maryland's flag is having this run of popularity, Virginia, man, their, their flag eh, kind of sucks. Ted, why did it happen this way? And why does it violate, I think, all five of those design principles you just laid out? I think it's important to distinguish design effectiveness from good and bad. What we really mean is effective flag design, ineffective flag design. And if you go back to the purpose of the flag to be signaling at a distance, Virginia's flag fails because it's one of 24 U.S. flags that has a seal on a blue background. So when you look at state flags at a distance, you're not going to be able to know which one is Virginia's. Virginia wanted to join other states that are considering changing their flags, like Utah just changed its flag. The governor is about to sign the bill that changes its flag. Minnesota is looking at changing its flag. Massachusetts is looking at it. And Mississippi and Georgia changed their flags to take the Confederate battle flags off. That's kind of a negative reason. But Virginia could do it for a good reason. Describing the Virginia flag, it's, it's liberty stomping out the tyrant as Six Semper Tyrannus. She's half topless, which might account for some of the popularity. But the, the <laughs> fundamental challenge, I believe, of the Virginia state flag is that it has the state government seal on it. All of these states that use a state seal are taking a government symbol and putting it on a flag. I like to say that the seal belongs to the government, but the flag belongs to the people. Do you think if D.C. were to get statehood, it would keep the same flag or Absolutely. get a new one? Absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. What's the history with, with other places that were territories and became states? Did they get new flags? Absolutely. Think of Hawaii, Texas, Alaska. California, arguably, Alaska. Um, and generally speaking, in the world of flags, when there's some kind of independence movement, if we think in the third world, decolonialization, it's often the group 
that led the decolonialization or the revolt against the oppressors, whose flag then gets adopted as the national flag. In other words, the flag under which the struggle was waged becomes the flag of the place. In DC, heck, you've got it on your license plates. I'm from Oregon and I know about DC's license plates. I'm not a betting person, but I would wager all my chips that that flag would remain should DC attain statehood. And that's interesting is that uh, the Maryland flag is on the Maryland license plates as well. There aren't many states. I don't know of any others that use the flag. Many of them use the map of their state. It is the states with great flag designs, effective flag designs, again, signaling at a distance that you need, you need to be able to see that license plate at a distance. New Mexico, Alaska, there are other states. If they use their flag, it's very likely because it's a great uh, image. So I'm curious, have either of you guys designed flags? And if so, what would you do to the Virginia flag if you could reinvent it? I wrote the book on flag design, but I'm not a designer. I like to think of myself more as a music critic than as a composer. (laughs) I know it good design when I see it. Mm -hmm. Usually when I see a poor flag design, there's a great design trying to get out. In Virginia's case, I think I'd start all over again. With those flags that have seals on them, I would start completely over again because I'm not sure any of the elements you could turn into a big, broad field of a flag. Yeah. I would love to see a big V for Virginia because it could also be for vexillology. (laughs) Well, that's what I was thinking, that they've got the letter V, which has a good shape. One of the challenges we see when people talk about a new state flag is when you get into choosing colors, very quickly it devolves into, well, those are the colors of the other guys, Mm -hmm. the other university in Mm -hmm. in the place. There's that issue. I think a very important thing to consider in the flag design is it doesn't have to do everything. It doesn't have to represent every single aspect of your state. It has to be just one thing that when people are told that represents our state, they'll remember it. The people can remember it. Like, I, I, I like to say that in Canada, there's more than one kind of tree than a maple tree. (laughs) <laughs> right. But Canada has just decided we're going to use maple leaf as our symbol and we're going to tell everybody that. And everybody who looks at it can recognize that maple leaf and know that's Canada. So I have one, one last question. In D.C., as, as we've said, like the, you start seeing the flag everywhere. I grew up here in the 70s and 80s. I don't remember seeing the D.C. flag everywhere, but I do now. Uh, we're in a time when a lot of the marketing and so on is geographic, right? This buy this kind of beer, it's like genuine from Oregon or something. Um, uh, and uh, so people, because there's an authenticity to something that is local, have flags in general become more popular as a thing people deploy for marketing or for identification or that sort of thing? I see more flags used as flag designs get better. A poorly designed flag just doesn't get used in marketing. But heck, the Texas flag is everywhere, and it's a great design. The city of Portland, my city here in Oregon, had a okay design, designed in 1969, but its designer went back 33 years later and improved it. And once it was improved, it started being used everywhere. I think also there's been some cultural shift. I think in the early 20th century, particularly through the mid-century, uh, there was a feeling that, that flags, you know, particularly the United States flag, should not be desecrated, should not be used for marketing purposes, uh, which led people, if they were going to use a flag, to use a non-U.S. Uh, flag. But I think that there's sort of been a whole loosening and an, and an informalization, if that's a word, uh, of the society so that we're willing to use things which we used to think of more as sort of sacred symbols, things that you didn't mess with the flag. You didn't sell, you didn't sell butter and cheese using the flag. These days, these days, anything goes. You know, you can put on <laughs> right. your underwear now and, you know, that's fine. I think Jack's right. People have loosened up a bit about use of the national flag and flags in general, as they've improved, we see more and more of them. I think the other thing is that the advent of digital printing technology has made many flags less expensive and therefore made it more possible for people to fly them. And particularly flags with good designs are simpler and they're easier to manufacture. 
Ted K, Jack Lowe, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, sure. It's been great. We could talk forever, but that's, uh, (laughs) we appreciate (laughs) being on. Hey there, co-host Bridget Todd here, popping in with some quick news. A group of McLean residents is suing the Virginia Department of Transportation over the expansion of I-495. The road project is already in its second year. The plaintiffs say the expansion violates federal law and will contribute to noise, light, and air pollution, water quality, erosion, and health issues. Meanwhile, Metro is expanding its new fare gates designed to deter fare evaders. They tested them out at Fort Totten Station this winter with great success, and now they're going to be putting them in at nine other stations around the DMV. This is one of many big changes the Metro is considering this year, including fare hikes and shorter wait times. Also, Magic Johnson, the L.A. Lakers basketball legend, is joining Josh Harris's bid to buy the Washington Commanders. Johnson already partially owns the L.A. soccer team, WNBA team, and its baseball team, the Los Angeles Dodgers. This also isn't the first time Harris and Johnson have teamed up. They unsuccessfully tried to buy the Denver Broncos. And today's D.C. Life Hack is from our guest, Jack Lowe. If you love going to the theater, a bunch of them across the city have great discounts for folks under 35. That includes the Studio Theater, Shakespeare Theater, and Woolly Mammoth Theater, so check out their website. That's all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, get the DC flag tattooed on your body. Tag us in your tweet about it, and we will share it with the world. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye.